Hey, thanks for joining us and welcome to the Becoming Podcast from New Life Church. We're so excited to share in this conversation with you today as we explore what it means to become more people, more like Jesus. Happy listening. Well, welcome to the Becoming Podcast, where it's great to have you back with us again. We've got a conversation today with two of my own personal heroes. Uh, And before we get that, if it's your first time on the Becoming Podcast, I just wanted to let you know that this whole podcast is about asking this question, who are we becoming? Who are you becoming? And we're passionate about the answer to that, hopefully being we want to be more like Jesus. And this the whole podcast wants to resource you in your journey and your discipleship. And to do that today, we have two special guests. Two our guests today, Jess. I'm really excited, Michael, because we've got Nikki and Silla Lee, who are the creators and founders of Alpha Marriage. Yes, definitely. Um, and I think through any season, whether you're single, taken, married, divorced, like I think marriage and relationships constantly is a hot topic. And not many people know this, but actually Nikki and Silla Lee were key people in leading Nikki, Nikki and Pippi, Pippa Gumbel yes. to come know Jesus, who, were the, yeah. uh, who really championed Alpha as well. Yes. So without their friendship, we don't know if a Nikki and Pippa would have come to know the Lord the way that they did either, which that is, is so amazing. That is so true. What are you that excited so about today's conversation? Um, I think when... You know, living in this society at the moment, divor- like divorce is so high in marriage and relationships, I think the divorce rate is 50%. And it's been like that for a really long time. And I think marriage and the whole concept of marriage has lost its value, has lost its worth. Um, You know, me, myself, before I came to faith, I didn't see the worth, like the value of marriage. I didn't even necessarily want to get married. Um, And I know a lot of people that are struggling to see you know, the idea and the concept of why we should get married. So I'm really looking forward to them shedding light in that. And yeah, how about yourself? Uh, I've I've uh, met Nikki and uh, Sila Lee uh, once and just the wisdom they have because they've done the hard yards. Yeah. And so they've uh, not only raised children, they've been married for a long time. Mm. And anyone that's been married that long has has not been married that long because it's been easy. It's yeah. because they've chosen to do hard things. Yeah. And they've got a lot of wisdom to offer. So we hope and pray, friends, that it's a blessing to you. So here's uh, Nikki, Nikki and Silla Lee on uh, what it means to be married. Well, we are so excited today to be joined by Nikki, Nikki and Silla Lee from Alpha Marriage. And you guys have just landed in Australia two days ago. We have, yeah. yeah well, welcome to Australia. Thank How are you enjoying the country so far? Oh, it's wonderful to be here in Brisbane and the blue sky and warm weather. Oh, it's fabulous. And a very warm welcome. We've, yeah. we've, oh, we've just met such lovely people since we've been here. Well, your reputation precedes you. You guys, you guys have been doing so much for marriages all around the world more than what you probably know or achieve. So we'd say thank you to you, oh, first of all. That's so yeah. kind. My wife and I have been married 11 years and okay. we've done the marriage course and we're massive fans of it. It was a big shifter for us. So it's brilliant. What are you, what are you thinking of Australia so far? Are you are coping with the heat okay? Oh, it's, yeah. it's just a delight. It's an absolute delight. And that people are so enthusiastic and we've met, I mean, even in, we've only been here two days, but we just get so excited when we meet wonderful people. We hear wonderful stories of people coming to faith, of marriages being transformed. We were on a radio program yesterday morning. And I mean, the guy who was interviewing us was just fabulous. And then he had callers ring in. And the first call was from a woman called Kirsty. I mean, she was on radio, so I don't think she minds us saying her name. And she just told us this beautiful story of how, I mean, she, in her words, said, going on the marriage course saved my life and transformed our marriage. Mm. And she'd had a lot of trauma with the birth of her first, mm. first child. Then um, they, they really, to sort of try and cope with all the fallout from that, they heard about the marriage course and went on it. Wow. But during that time, they lost a second child. Oh my gosh. And, and she said, we would honestly, it was only because of what we had learned, the tools and the skills to communicate with each other that we, we managed to hang in there. Mm-hmm. And she said, that was how many years ago? That was 13 years ago. years ago. Wow. They've been married 15 years. And then wow. the, the guy who was interviewing us, talking to Kirsty. 
online. Said, so, uh, and you know, have you done other things to follow up since then? And, and Gussie just said. I just tell everybody to do the marriage course. <laughs> Buy the marriage course. Go and do it. And, and it was lovely. She was from Brisbane and she just said, it's wonderful. There are churches running the marriage course all around my area. So send my uh, friends. So, so we course. thought, wow, how exciting. So it was very encouraging. No, you that. would be like, encouraged. You would yeah. be. And I mean, we, you know, Becoming Podcast is the name of what we're doing here. Mm. It's f focused on people who are new to faith mm. and who may never have heard of the marriage course mm. before. So when we're talking about the Alpha Marriage Course, what are we talking about? What is the Alpha Marriage Course? And, well, and, and, uh, and in a moment, I'm going to get you to share your story as well yeah. about how you two met. Well, in, in summary, there are actually two courses. Mm. There's the pre-marriage course, and that's for couples who are either engaged mm. or who want to explore getting married. Mm. And today... There are a lot more couples who who are, are cautious of marriage, maybe because they've had a painful experience in their past, maybe because their parents' marriage or relationship broke up. A and we want to give couples the opportunity to, to really see what marriage is about and how actually the commitment of marriage, rather than tying us down, can be liberating because yeah, it helps to build trust between us. It enables openness and vulnerability, and that builds real close intimacy. Mm -hmm. So that's one course, and then the other one? Well, we'd been running the, the pre-marriage course for a number of years, and what we started to realize was these couples who come on the, on the pre-marriage course, they're in love, they're infatuated, they're wearing those rose-tinted specs, and they think everything's just going to be rosy. Yeah. And then what they realize is actually there's things one has to kind of work through and there's, you know, a whole journey ahead and they need those tools. And so we thought we need to develop a course that we can get them back within two or three years and they can do a refresher. Mm. And so that's why we developed um, the seven sessions of the marriage course. Mm. And really, it's just been amazing because we thought it was just for couples in the first five years of marriage. Yeah. But actually, after the first course, we realized there were couples coming who'd been married longer, 10, 20 years more. And the feedback we got from all of the couples coming, and they were in very different situations, some with great marriages, investing, others struggling, um, others just sort of cruising and not really feeling connected. Mm. And we heard the same feedback that actually they benefited, that this, this opportunity on the marriage course to take seven evenings together mm. to invest in their relationship had really changed things. And can I just say about the marriage course and the pre-marriage course, probably the central part of the courses is during each session, there is time for the couple to talk privately together as a couple around the different topics. Yeah. And we know those are the transformational times yeah. on the courses. And we also know that probably 95% of the couples who come wouldn't come if there was a group discussion. Yeah. So they're yeah. absolutely sure you're just going to have this privacy to have and important conversations. Maybe I'm, things- I'm moderated in many ways as well, right? Yes, it's just yes, exactly. totally, yeah. totally. And maybe things they haven't talked about before, ever, mm. or maybe things that they didn't know they needed to talk about. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the, this gives them an opportunity, a sort of safe environment mm. to start to talk about these topics and discover what each other feels. Yeah. Couples again and again say, I learned more about my partner and more about myself yeah, as a result beautiful. of the course. What, what I love about the, the Marriage Alpha course, you started because you saw a need in your local community, mm -hmm. overflowing from your life. It's now gone global around the world. Um, I mean, I, I don't know what it must be like to rock up in a nation where you have churches that you've never met the pastors or people of seeing your faces. Mm -hmm. I've done the marriage course, the way you adoringly look at each mm -hmm. other and lovingly look at each other. Um, but it begins with a story, it begins mm. with your story. Yeah. It begins with how, how you guys met. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I, I've heard it, but I think our, our listeners would be really blessed by how did you guys come to be married um, and into a space where you thought, oh, we want to input into other marriages as well. How did you two meet? Well, we met when we were teenagers. Mm. I was 18, Scylla was just 17. Uh, and we were going on holiday to the same place in the southwest of Ireland. Wow. We actually, we met in a, we no, met in a queue <laughs> for a car ferry. I was sitting in my car and I watched this girl trying to peel a sticker off the car in yeah. front of mine. And I, I was absolutely 
I was just gripped. And then a friend came up and said, I want to introduce you to my friend Scylla. Wow. When I met her. And it, and it really was. It was love at first sight. We, <laughs> we both fell for each other. Although neither of us told the other. It took us two weeks before we discovered the feelings were mutual. That's but amazing. anyway. It, were you Christians at the time? No, no we were, were not. Christians. We were not. Yeah. But we did, we did start going out right away. And that, I mean, you know, we were just like, I, well, I felt I want to be with this guy for the rest of my life. And I thought the world's my oyster. I know how to do life. I've got a great guy and off we went. And then just when we started university, there was a mission at university and an amazing guy came to speak. And Nikki had kind of over a number of, of weeks been exploring the Christian faith, talking to somebody, and he took him to hear some talks. And then we came together, and over a weekend, really, I heard for the first time about the Christian faith. Wow. And actually, we both, on the final night of this, this week-long series of talks, we both came to faith. And um, so that changed it, a lot. It took me about four four and a half months to get there. It took still 24 hours. Wow. That's pretty typical. That tells you yeah. something about us. <laughs> That's your personality still types right exactly. there. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stella gets there quicker than I do. <laughs> so the fact I was exploring Christianity, I kept very much away from her because mm. I wanted, I didn't want her to jump to any conclusions. Yeah. I wanted to have time to make up my own mind. And obviously once we had come to faith, I mean, there were big implications in kind of learning about how to follow Jesus mm. and what that meant for our relationship. And that for the next two and a half years, we learned a lot mm. about God's ways of loving mm. and which was slightly different from our ways. And, and, but so good, yeah. so, so good. Instead of being actually really quite intensely just focused on each other and quite inward looking, quite exclusive, quite, I don't know, we just, I'd say in, it, one of the things we learned was the difference between lusting after one mm. another and loving one wow. another. Yeah. And that was a very big change. What is the difference? What is the difference? Yeah. The difference is, I think part of lust is just a sense of wanting self-gratification, oh. obviously through the sexual relationship, but actually it becomes a kind of mindset. I'm, I'm wanting something from you to fulfill me. Yeah, wow, well, yeah. And, and loving is the other way around. Yeah. Is giving of ourselves to the other person for what is best for them. Yeah. I, I remember reading um, Pope John Paul II, mm. last Pope but one, wrote a lot about and spoke and wrote a lot about marriage and relationships and family yeah. life because he knew this was so important for our society yeah. today. Yeah. And I remember reading this line where he said, the opposite of loving someone. I thought I knew what he was going to say, the rest mm. of the sentence. I thought he was going to say hating them, but it wasn't. He said, the opposite of loving someone is using them. Wow. Use, and that really struck me. Mm. And, and then he goes on to describe marriage as this, he describes it as the total donation of self. And he says, this is the most intimate of human relationships, but it's about this mutual giving to each other. And then from there, he starts to unpack it. And, and he talks about how the marriage relationship is a reflection of God's relationship with us. Mm. Jesus gives himself, just as he said at the Last Supper, this is my body given for you. Yeah. So in marriage, we give ourselves to each other. Yeah. And in doing that, insofar as we love each other, giving ourselves to each other, we become a picture of God's love for us and for the world. Yeah. And, and I remember when I read that, I thought, gosh, marriage is much more than just our love. <laughs> yeah, it? yeah, it's yeah, much bigger. Yeah. It has a much bigger yeah. God-given purpose than, than yeah. we'd realised or than most people actually realise today. Yeah. So what do you think the narrative is that the world tells us about marriage? Um, because 
one of the questions I'd even have building on the back of that is, can you be married and use the person you're married to rather than love the person mm. you're married to? Which I, I think you'd probably both say yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so, so what are the key markers between a marriage which is Christ-centered and maybe a marriage that doesn't have Christ in it? Well, would you see any clear distinctions between those two understandings? Well, first of all, I think you'd have to say there are no perfect marriages. Right. Yeah. So it is in terms of what we seek, what we're seeking to do. And yeah. I think Jesus both inspires us by example. So as he's loved us, giving himself for us, so we are to love each other. But he also inspires us by his spirit living within mm. us. So giving us those, that inward desire, that strength in order to be able to love each other. Yeah, great. I think it's beautiful. Mm. Mm. One, of the, one of the key challenges I, f I think in our day and age is the challenge around sex. Yeah. Yeah. And where sex sits in yeah. marriage. I, yeah. I, young adults in my church always talking to me about, but why? Mm. Why sex for marriage? For marriage. Um, you know, we love each other. We, why can't we just yeah. take a step? I mean, you guys yeah. would, uh, were, were probably engaging in some of these things before you were Christians, yeah, right? Totally. So, so talk to us a little bit about as much as you want to, as yeah. I, but I've heard you talk yeah. about it on the well, video yeah. already. So <laughs> we I feel very aware well. of where, you, where you're yeah. going to go. But um, uh, how does, how does a Christian understanding of sex enrich sex, not rob us of yeah, sex in so yeah. many ways? And maybe even share some of your own story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think, I mean, personally, we've experienced that the, the design that God has for sex to be within the context of the commitment of a marriage relationship and the vows that we make to love one another, be faithful to one another, to serve one another for the rest of our lives. Yeah. And, and that is where this most intimate act and the most private thing that one could ever, ever give mm. to another person is intended to be nurtured. Yeah. And, and we cheapen love every time we give that gift away to another person. Now, I know many people, and I felt this, I thought, well, I'm not promiscuous, I'm not sleeping around, I just love this guy, why can't I express my love by, by having sex and yeah. sleeping together? That's my expression of loving him. But in retrospect now, and, and we really learned this when we came to follow Jesus, that actually we're so vulnerable when we're outside of God's plans mm -hmm. and God's design for us as fallible human beings. Yeah, wow. and, and even though we both desired to get married, we didn't know at that stage whether we were ultimately. And to give this most precious part of ourselves to another person mm -hmm. before we'd made those vows is always a big risk wow. of it may not turn out that we get married. Yeah. And then you have given that to someone. And then when you do get married to someone, it's like, well, I should have kept this mm. for you to actually show this is the ultimate giving of self, the giving of yourself to another person. So, so we learned the hard way. And we, when we came to faith, we both knew, no one told us, nobody said, stop it or anything like that. Yeah, well. It was totally the work of the Spirit in our hearts mm. saying, actually, there's a better way and I want to show you the better way. And we learn in the sort of, it was about two and a half years before we then did get married. And we learned such a lot that was exactly what Nikki was describing, this totally looking out and looking, how can I meet your need? How can I, but without the sex. Mm. And that, that had, you have to get very, very kind of, uh, creative and, and, yes. and really saying, okay, so what does loving really mean? I, I would imagine especially having to take a step back. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you have to be creative even before this, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then having to have taken a step back from yeah. that, that would, have, that would have been even more difficult. And it, did, and it took, you know, it, it was lessons in self-control. And again, just like we were saying, that's a, you know, the, the, the Paul talks about it as the fruit of the Spirit, self-control. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you realize actually in marriage, you need mm -hmm. self-control because we can get attracted to a whole load of people potentially yeah. when we're married. Yeah. But actually saying, no, we're going to 
keep yeah. directing those yeah, sexual great. attraction, those desires towards each other. And then the sex in marriage becomes a, a really precious, important part of, of strengthening our connection together, our intimacy. And we, we, we say this on the marriage course, you know, uh, every other part of our marriage, the, the emotional connection we create with each other through our communication, through having the time fun together. we spend together having fun, enhances our sexual relationship, but our sexual relationship then enhances mm. every other part mm. of, of our marriage. The two, it's not like sex is just the icing on the cake of a marriage. Sex is an, an ingredient of the cake itself. Mm. But what is crazy in our culture today, we know so many married couples, I mean, whether Christians or not Christians, who they get married and then basically they stop having sex, stop having sex, you know, and the world are, and Christians who, who, whether, you know, are trying to not have sex before they get married, they can't believe it. They think, what is going on? This is a topsy-turvy world. And that, I think, just says it all. And we have to really and we do on the marriage course say, no, this is very precious. Mm. This is a beautiful part of building closeness, connection, intimacy, and don't let it you just die it. out. You, you must it. nurture it like every other part of your relationship. And um, But it needs to be seen in the context of how precious it is. It's, not, yeah. it's just not a commodity to be sort of cheapened. Mm. Yeah. Speaking about that, speaking about the way that we see marriage and the health of those marriages, divorce rates are pretty high mm -hmm. at the yeah. moment. In your work with couples, do you see a commonality around why divorce is on, on such a rise? I know the British culture may be very different no, from Australian it's the culture. Same. I don't think it is that different, actually, yeah. from what we've heard, what we've observed, the stories mm -hmm. that we've heard. And I, I think there are, there are a number of factors in our culture today. And one of them is the pressure of time. Mm. And we, we live busier lives, there's no question. The, the, the means of communication we have means that we can be communicating to more and more people faster and faster speed. But the danger is that stops us communicating with the person who's closest to us, our husband or wife, and, and those others who are, who are, who are closest. So, yeah. That is a huge pressure. Just this little device mm. of mobile phone, which is so useful, such benefit, such a brilliant device, and yet it can mm. it can stop yeah. this connection between us. That that's a huge factor. I think actually, um, I mean, the statistics are quite complicated. But one thing I would really want to say is, many people think that. I, I'm afraid of commitment, so I will live with someone and find out if this is going yeah. to be okay. Yeah. But actually, all the statistics show that cohabiting relationships are way more vulnerable and fragile yeah. than marriage relationships. Why do, you, why do you think that is? Well, it's totally because of this, the, the commitment, the vows we make once we actually decide. Because yeah. the thing is, very often couples will slide into living together. Yeah. Suddenly, you know, you're, you're in two different flats and you're both paying rent. And then you think, oh, well, it would be much cheaper if we just moved in together and then we're only paying one rent. And so it goes on. And then you kind of think, oh, well, we'll have a mobile account together. Then we'll get a dog yeah. and then we'll, and, but, but you're not making a decision about your relationship, really. No. You are just sliding into being together. Yeah. And when you make a decision to actually commit to marry mm. and get married, that is a very internally powerful decision. Oh, gosh, and is. then yeah. you have this context of the commitment of the vows in which you have, as we've described, this trust is, is able to build with an openness because you're not about to just walk out the door. Yeah. And so, so cohabiting relationships are much more fragile and breaking down at a faster and faster rate wow. than marriages. So actually in the UK, will you stay the stats? That, I mean, the divorce stats haven't changed dramatically. They've increased a bit, but not a dramatically. Bit, but not dramatically. It's more the breakdown people, of cohabiting. And it's people not getting married. Yeah. Over, I think it was over 30 years between 1991 and 2021. I think the, the marriage rate, i.e. the number of people getting married per thousand of the population, halved. Wow. 
And which is simply because of what Silla was describing, people choosing to cohabit instead of getting married. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But, and, and then often having children as well within these relationships, but then these relationships breaking down much yeah. faster. And of course, the more it, it becomes a vicious circle. Mm. So the more uh, people, uh, well, let's say children growing up without their parents together or they've seen the painful mm. separation of their parents' relationship, mm. then they're more cautious themselves. So yeah. the next generation. So it's seeking to reverse that, yeah, seeking completely. to help people to see that actually marriage is a beautiful mm. thing. The Amen. commitment within marriage is a powerful, liberating thing, yeah, not, not yeah. a restricting thing. And actually, as the church, we have such a great opportunity um, on two levels. A, to inform people, in a, in a sense, of that truth, yeah. that marriage is actually good, yeah. not a scary thing or a frightening thing or something that ties you down or something that r reduces your freedom to be who you are because we don't we don't lose who we are when we become married. No, I mean that's right. people talk about people who are married talk about my other half. I mean that is such a untruth. You do not become half a person when you get married. Yeah. You are fully you. Yeah. And Nikki is fully him. Yeah. And we come together and we build a partnership together, right. but we are individually made by God, yeah. unique and loved as an individual. Our identity is in Him. Amen. But, but oh, what, what was I talking about then? <laughs> <laughs> can, I go, can I go on a slightly good. different yeah, track, please Michael. do. Can I just say, I think the other big issue today is that there, and, and I know this has been around for quite a long time, the sort of Hollywood myth mm. about mm. Uh, marriage and love and, and that, you know, if you happen to marry the right person, if you meet the one mm. and marry them, then all will be well. But if you marry and it doesn't seem to be going so well, then people think, oh, I haven't married the right person. Yeah. I need to ditch them mm. and, and go on looking go on for the someone. one. And this is a myth. It's not the one. It's actually there are things we can do to yeah. make a relationship work. And yeah. then when people realize that, that it's not a question of luck, it's yeah. not just a question of whether you met the right person, no, but exactly. actually there are things we can do for our communication, for resolving conflict, for making our relationship work and to get better and to last, mm. that sets them free. Yeah. Because they're not at the mercy of some form of sort of fate. Yeah. And I've remembered what I was going oh, to well say. Then. The other, the opportunity for the church is to be very um, practical yeah. and to offer practical support and encouragement for Amen. relationships. Yeah. And I mean, actually, we need to do it at every stage of life, you know, for, for yeah. young people, young families, relationship, yeah. um, help, support, education, and single people and married people and people preparing to get married and so on. And that's why we feel passionate that the church. Yeah. Church has such a great opportunity because people everywhere are looking for help with relationships. Yeah, and, you know, it's hard to find help. And, and on that, the, the Bible talks about marriage in a very different way than we hear about in the world. It talks about yeah. love your wife like Christ mm -hmm. loved the church, serve yeah. your husband. What, what is the importance of how you guys understand covenant and the way that covenant plays out in marriage? And indeed, how does marriage reflect and why should it reflect God's relationship with us? Um, of course, that passage that you've quoted where Paul is talking about uh, what marriage is, that was radical teaching because in the, in the Roman world, in the Roman Empire, the husband, the father had total control, yes. total rights over his family, his wife, his children, his slaves, he could do what he liked. And, and Paul switches it around and he says, no, submit to each other. Yeah. And submitting to each other essentially means serving each other, serving yeah. each other's needs, looking out for each other. Yeah. And, and this becomes a covenant of love yeah. where we are, uh, the, the covenant we make is to love and support and to serve each other yeah. and that that and and particularly because 
the church met in homes. Yeah. And where it was a household, yeah. you know, not just a nuclear family like we think of it today. A household was a whole household, maybe three generations with servants, with slaves, and so on. Yeah. But right at the heart of this was this marriage relationship, yeah. which, as you said, where the husband, he had a, it was very different to the, the sort of what was around in the world. And when that started to happen when the husband was loving his wife as Christ yeah. loved him, and loved the church. That changed and people saw yes. the beauty of this relationship. Yeah. And the church met in houses, met yeah. in these households. And so what was being seen and modeled and that what Paul was instructing yeah. was unbelievably countercultural. Yes. And yeah. people give Paul a very hard time and they say he's anti-women and all that. He wasn't. He was completely for women and for a totally new social structure where, where marriage was an equal partnership, yeah. where absolutely this serving and respecting one another and giving of oneself was absolutely at the heart. And the church is where that first started. Yeah. And, and I mean, we've lost our way at m many times, but I, I, I think we have to get back to that covenant yeah. relationship. And you're love. right in understanding that it's a, it's a covenant, not a contract. A contract no. is where no. we each have things that we do. Uh, to fulfill the kind yeah, of... Yeah, it's give and take yeah. all the yeah. time. A covenant is, different. The covenant is based on, on a promise, yes, on a promise yes. to love. And in that, that reflects the covenant of love that God yeah. makes with us. No, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I, th I think for me, um, uh, I don't know if you know the works of Tim Keller. Yes. yes. But Tim Keller yeah. said this line that changed uh, my perspective of marriage. He said, you can never marry the right person. You can never marry the wrong person. You marry someone and what you do next makes them the right person. Mm, yes. right? I think you can Wonderful. marry people that are more helpful yeah. and yeah. less helpful. You guys seem to have really landed the plane well on that one. Oh, we um, have our differences. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But that's a, that's a beautiful and the right way to look at it. That's very helpful. Because we spend most of our lives looking for our one. Yeah. Just the, our one. And um, another guy, Lou Giglio, said like this. He said, you found your one. Mm. Your yeah. one is God. Your uh, one is Jesus. Yes. You're not looking for your one. No. You're looking for someone that's going to help you pursue your one. Yes, help yes, you pursue yes. the, the one of your heart. Yes. Uh, Keller also has this great line where he says um, in his book, Meaning of Marriage, he says, one day, real love, real marriage is where you'll stand before the throne of God yes. and you'll look to the person next to you and you'll see them in their, in their full glory and you'll say, I always knew. Yeah. Always knew you could look like this. <laughs> yeah. I saw a glimpse of it on earth. I yeah. got to journey with you yeah. to see you become this. And there's this this image of marriage, mm. which is about more than just romance. Yeah. Although romance is so oh, important. Yeah. Yeah. It's about more than just yeah. sex, although sex is such an important ingredient. Yes. It's this it's this mm. selfless giving to who this other person yes. has uh, will become, yes. has become. And I think, you know, in a Christian marriage with Jesus at the center, the ripples go out and out and out. Yeah. And and I think we have to help couples understand mm. that they and what their lives reflect is an incredibly powerful and beautiful thing. And we know countless stories of people who've come from very chaotic, very dysfunctional backgrounds, who've, who've had painful experiences, and they are around um, a, a church community um, of single people and married people, and they learn about what the love of God is through real human relationships of marriage and of, of friendship. And that is very, very powerful. And we want to kind of help couples to see that actually they have such a, an amazing opportunity that these, these wonderful ripples keep going out and out. Mm. So every time anybody comes into a Christian home and sees a Christian marriage, they are impacted, yeah. absolutely beautifully impacted. And, um, and that's a, a very good reason to be leading mm. lives of fully, fully authentic and integrated. So we are, you know, and particularly for those in church leadership to, to be leading lives absolutely the same in our homes, in our yeah. marriages, with our families, and in our, you know, those relationships as we do in a wider context. And that was what was modeled to us, actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, really all the way through yeah. our Christian journey, but, but, but right at the start, it was seeing Christian 
uh, marriages and Christian families. And we thought that's what we want. Wow. And we learned from them. We learned from those who are ahead of us and older. And we continue to do so. Yeah. Interesting question for each of you personally. You guys teach one of the world's most famous marriage courses. <laughs> well, first question, do you still get it wrong? <laughs> and secondly, secondly, is yeah, there, yeah, still it does from yeah. time to time, Michael. Is is there, <laughs> do you have a proclivity? Is there something in you you're like, you know, the one part of our marriage teaching I struggle with the most? Do you have something that you have to oh, continue to remind of yourself of? <laughs> like, what would be an example? Well, you go first. I'll I'll, I'll, <laughs> and if she gets it wrong, yeah, you I'll can let, it, yeah, yeah. You, you let Silla know what, what, what the answer is. I mean, how long have you got? Yeah, I have right. a long <laughs> list. Okay, probably my, my biggest flaw is I am not a naturally good listener. Mm. And I have had to- I'm not mm there because I've experienced that at all. <laughs> no, I think you're a great conversationalist, Silla. Yeah, yeah. And I really recognize um, the power of listening mm. and what an amazing gift it is in a close relationship. And it's not just in a marriage relationship, though obviously that is the most important one because you're so up close and personal, but a a- parent, child, child, a parent, child, child, parent, or friends, or even colleagues, yeah. all of it. Listening is something that's so key. Wow. And I am not naturally good at it. Yeah. I have to really intentionally, I've had to learn to be a, an effective and a good listener. Yeah. And when I get heated, when I'm kind of, you know, Nikki's deciding he thinks he, we should do something one way and I'm saying, you must be crazy. I want, I'm just off on my agenda, my way of thinking. I've got to be right. I'm not, and instead of asking him, okay, tell me a bit more about what yeah. you're thinking. Yeah. And if I can stop and listen, oh my goodness, we save so much conflict. And I think for me, I, I'm an internal processor and I like to keep things peaceful and calm and happy. So if I'm upset, if someone's hurt me, and she's often got, had no idea that she said or done something to upset me, I can sort of stew on it and think about it. And I have to keep remembering it's better to talk about it, to bring it out. I try to use the right moment. But that is a constant reminder. That's not rather than burying actually to be able to talk about. And it's so, if I'm worried about something, it's so much better when I've shared it with Zilla. Yeah. Or well, she's hurt me, it's so much better when she then knows and she can say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna try not to do it again. And then it's all done, it's all sort of dusted and yeah. forgiven. But I don't do that naturally. I have to keep remembering and reminding myself. But I think that's the most encouraging thing we've learned over a lifetime of being married, is we can always change. Yeah. We can't change our partner, but we can really yeah. change ourselves yeah. and with God's help. And there are many times, I mean, for example, when we have four kids and I absolutely thrived and loved parenting them when they were kind of under 10. It just came naturally to me. I loved it and it was great. I really wasn't naturally good with teenagers. And boy, we started, I started to have a very, um, bumpy journey with our kids as they became teenagers. And I found it very challenging. Nikki is a natural with teenagers. I really had to change my way of parenting. I had to go on a big learning curve. I really needed his support. And, you know, that kind of change is possible. It, you know, we can learn and be, become self-aware and really we can learn new ways of doing things. So mm. I would want to say to anybody who's thinking, no, we're incompatible, we're just too different, we're just like, it doesn't work, it can work. Yeah. But we just need to have the tools and we need to actually ask God for help yeah, to, to, to change. To Probably it's about pride. We think mm. we're right and actually we're not necessarily right and we can do it a different way. We just need to learn a different way. Yeah, I think it's so encouraging. I, I mean, I don't think people talk about their failures in marriage enough. No. And we have these, this veneer, don't we? Yeah. Where we, we're holding everything together yeah. and you have these married couples coming through going, and even young people, single people coming through going, they just look at, just make it look so easy. I know. Um, but can I, can I tell you a little story, Michael? No, please. We were in London, there's the underground, we call it the tube. Yeah. And, um, we were going from our home when we lived in central London, about, I don't know, six stops, seven yeah. stops. And, and I 
cannot to this day remember what the issue was, but Scylla and I were having, Scylla was really upset with me. And as we said, she was telling me quite loudly, very passionately, how upset she was. That doesn't strike me as true, Nicky. <laughs> I, I've not seen that characteristic yet. <laughs> Just about a little bit longer around us. You'll see it. It won't take too long. And anyway, um, there, were a f there were other people in the carriage, not, not very many, but there was somebody who was standing not very far from us. And he was getting out before we did. But just before he got out, he paused and he said, looked at us and said, you're Nicky and Scylla Lee, aren't you? I'm doing the marriage course with my wife at, you know, another part of London. And we thought, oh, no. He's, and then he got he's off. heard the whole thing. And then he got off the, <laughs> tube. Got off the tube. We didn't have a time to sort of say, oh, well, uh, mm, you know, like this. Anyway, after that, I said, if we're having a disagreement in public, Keep a smile on your face and keep talking in a low tone. <laughs> we are the brand. Know. We are the brand. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Oh, I think that's brilliant. Um, Nicky Gumbel had a similar story about once when he was riding uh, yes. on, on, his the, bike. Yeah, on his bike. <laughs> and a taxi and driver. And he, and he, and he, uh, and he started yeah. to like, you know, harass this guy. Yeah. Go around and he's like, hey, Nicky, <laughs> yes. I'm doing Alpha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which brilliant. is so great. But there's a beauty to that too, isn't it? Yeah. Because yeah. I think Christians... Uh, we ourselves, we're, we're stumbling our way home. We're yeah. not perfecting oh, yeah. in any way, shape or form. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, do, you, do you find, why do you think married couples find it so difficult to ask for help? Oh, God. You know, like in my experience, uh, there's almost this people come and talk to you, mm. but it's like, oh, but we don't want to. Yeah. We don't want to do the marriage alpha yeah. course because yeah. we're fine. And, and it's honestly oh, getting over that, that hump. It's just a mindset. Isn't it? It is totally a mindset. And it's in both, I'd say, the Christian community and in the wider community. There's a stigma around doing anything for your relationship or sort of showing vulnerability and, and so on. And actually, I think we just have to turn that on its head. I mean, I always, we always give this example of in the UK when the, the government brought in the seatbelt law. And it was exactly when we were starting to drive, yeah. and um, which is a I mean, a lifetime away before yeah, you were ever the born. The last century. <laughs> Ancient history. <laughs> and we thought it was so uncool to wear a seatbelt. Yeah. We just didn't wear seatbelts. And then, you know, the government kind of put in fines and it wasn't really working and people were still not wearing them. They realised they had to do a serious, serious campaign to change the culture around seatbelts. And they did. I mean, they did a serious... It was, oh, gosh, and they were scary. You know how... <laughs> crashes and all the rest. And now, I mean, anybody who's normal just puts on a seatbelt. We put our kids in seatbelts. It saves lives. It's the norm. It's what we do. Yeah. And that's what we have to do with marriage yeah, so and true. saying relationships need investing. They need support. They need help. We all do. Leaders do. Everybody. It's not a question of, oh, we've reached this level Tick to box, we're all fine. Yeah, it's not about that. It's an ongoing mindset change, and, and that took some time at our church in London at HTB, where the to become normal for every couple to do the marriage course. And actually, one of the great benefits of the course is nobody says why they've come. Nobody yeah. has to say what state their marriage is in. Yeah. So people could be really struggling, hanging by a thread and they can come and do the yeah. course, they have these private conversations, and so often that can start to turn things yeah. around for them. And then they might choose to tell us their story. Sometimes they do, and that's lovely. Yeah. Uh, but but it's, but the, the culture, as Silla says, mm. getting that shift so that it's a normal thing to invest in your relationship, it's a good yeah. thing to do. And we sometimes compare it to going to a gym. You know, people go to a gym, do you call them gyms here yes, to get we, healthy? Yes, we call them gyms, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's a, yeah, to that's stay, a in normal, shape. stay in shape. We, we use the analogy with our marriage. Like a car service. Oh, yeah. You know, okay. A car service, yeah. yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean something's wrong, but nope. it's just yeah. helpful to go in to make Absolutely. sure there's, there's nothing under the roof. Totally, yeah. Totally. yeah. And, you know, I, 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 I don't know if there's a couple who would come and do the marriage course where they wouldn't get something out of it. And for Silla and myself, mm. every time we've run the course, we get reminded of something or some, well, well, we, we have another really conversation. Good, yeah. That was really <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> and we, we have another, we talk about something else that we felt. And, yeah. and, and so we never get to the end of, of learning about each other, of, mm. of working at our, our relationship mm. and getting closer. It, it has so many rewards. 
So you, you guys have been married for how many years now? 47. 47. Wow. What are you doing, for your, what are you doing for your 50th? Oh, gosh. We haven't thought about that. Oh, oh, sorry. Bloody how have you not Michael? thought about it? <laughs> no. Come back to Australia. We'll show you a good time. <laughs> but you're, you're, you're a descent of marriage yeah. in terms yeah. of, you know, yeah. so let's pray for another 50 years. Yeah. Right? Oh, well. but, but thinking about people down the other end, yeah. they're not yet married. Do you, do you think much, have you ever counseled people through one, I think, the biggest misnomers in the church, the dating relationship? Oh, yeah. yeah how do you, how do you uh, what advice do you give to young Christians approaching dating um, or courting or whatever noma? Because it's, it's this grey zone for the mm. Christian world. I, I think one of the, the big th things in our experience is helping people to take risks. Mm. And... I don't know whether we're more risk averse. I think or the I think this younger generation is risk averse. But it, it certainly plays into what we've been talking about, yeah. the understanding of you know marriages, you find the one. Yeah, Whereas yeah. actually it is about going on dates, taking risks, yeah. exploring relationships. And it's only through doing that that we we grow and we learn. We only learn to relate through relating. There is no other way. You cannot yeah, great. learn from a book. You can't learn from a podcast. Mm. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You've yeah. got to do, do it. it. And that takes a risk. It's starting to... And of course you don't spill your guts and tell them everything on the first date. Yeah. But going and uh, asking questions, seeking to draw the other person mm. out, not just talking all the time finding out about them, and you explore and you discover. And it may be it doesn't come to anything, but you've had a nice time together, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then that is the way in which, um, in dating, then you start to grow, you start to discover, and you may discover, oh, my goodness, we've got something going here, yeah. and you've got another dish and another dish, and so on and so forth. Yeah. I think taking, taking those risks is a is a big part of what it takes and what sometimes people avoid. Yeah. And I think in a church context, I, I feel for many, many churches and certainly our church and, and, and many in the UK have sort of frozen in terms of relationships and dating. And it's like you're in this massive, great big goldfish bowl and yes. everybody's watching and they're yes. kind of saying... Everyone's talking about oh, everybody's it. Yeah. Will they get married? Will oh they my goodness. So it's like yeah. everybody's like, ah, not doing that. And so actually what happens is people end up going, looking for completely inappropriate relationships somewhere else. And that's no fun. So we as the church need to teach about relationships and how to date well. And we have, I mean, the, at HTB, there's a dating uh, course, which, and then we need to do lots more relationship teaching and helping and just freeing people up to take these risks and, and make friends. But with a very good understanding of some core values yeah. around it and how not to hurt people, how not to yeah. take, you know, m use people and all of that stuff. So yeah, yeah. there's things to learn. Yeah, it'd be brilliant. I love it. I love the idea of the taking risks thing because it's so true. Yeah. We try and find the person and put all this weight on this one yeah. person yeah. that you've got to be the one I'm going to spend the rest of my life with or whatever. But it just, mm -hmm. it can often sabotage the process before yeah. it's even begun. Yeah. You guys have uh, just stepped back from running Alpha Marriage at HTB. Mm -hmm. You're obviously still very much spokespeople for Alpha Marriage. Yes. But what's uh, what's what's next in this next season? You know, let's say there is another 50 uh, years in front of growing you. Growing vegetables. <laughs> growing vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> this is, and marriage does go through seasons. Yeah. And for us, this is a very exciting new season yeah. for us. There are new, new opportunities. We we get to spend more time together now yeah. than we have mm. in the past. We we handed over the marriage course and the other relationship courses at HGB to a wonderful younger couple. Actually, they were they are at the stage we were at when we started. And oh my goodness, it's so exciting seeing them taking on the courses. Mm -hmm. They love it. They're passionate about yeah. it. I think they'll do a better job than we ever did, actually. <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah. But and, it's, yeah, and, and for us, it's like, um, it's wonderful the way God has led us into like a new open vista and an open yeah. door into other opportunities. And um, I mean, we are still, as you say, um, um, 
ambassadors? Ambassadors, if you like, around um, the world for, for marriage course globally. And, and we are very, very happy to be doing that as long as anybody thinks it's useful. Um, and particularly God, if he thinks it's yeah. useful for us yeah. to do that. But, but actually, m more about we feel um, quite passionate about supporting church leaders and their marriages. And we have um, a little space next to the home we live, which is a little cottage. And we're inviting couples to come there to just have a wow. retreat, to wow. just be there with their families for a few days and, and no, no charge because we have donors who are making that possible. Mm. And that's so lovely. And then to, we have a chance just to get together with them, yeah. to chat with them, to pray with them. And that we love that. We love doing that. Wow. So I guess two questions to, to close up the podcast. The first one would be prayer. Mm. What role does prayer have in your marriage and what would be your encouragement for the role of prayer in marriage at all? Shall I say we, what we did when we first got married? Uh, go on. Okay, so a great friend of ours, when we got married, he, he said to us, you must pray in your marriage every day. Yeah. It was a great piece of advice. He just didn't explain what he meant by that. And so Nikki and I set off. We set about, it was having, like a Bible study of most of Ephesians and then praying. Went on for about hours, an hour and a quarter. You know, when we got so back from work. So the next night we thought, oh my God, I can't face that again. I mean, we're exhausted. <laughs> so, uh, and so it was a sort of lurching from just yeah. occasionally spending a very long time. And, and then we came up with this idea that we would pray just for a few minutes each morning. And we'd simply ask each other the question, what can I pray for you today? And then just pray in response to that. And we did it before we had to leave the house to go to work. And so we had 10 minutes to do it. And that was amazing. It was a very powerful thing to do because, of course, if somebody's going to pray for you, you tell them what, what's, you know, what's the most on your mind, what you're most worried about, anxious about. And sometimes it'd be the same thing day after day, but that was fine. And then just saying the, uh, a short prayer for each other. Mm. And we've sought to do that. Mm each day and that that simple question what can i pray for you today and then and then praying it it builds um it actually helps to build intimacy as well as discovering god answers mm -hmm. these prayers in wonderful ways and doing that. praying in that context of a little but very personal then spills over into kind of moments and ways of praying that that actually there's a desire to pray rather than a disincentive to pray yeah. and 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 obviously reading the bible is a, is an important part for us and and we do that individually but when we come to pray together we will always look at a verse refer to or something refer to something bible and, in one year oh we yeah that bible in one year Every morning. Yeah, and that anchors us. And it's amazing how we realize when you read the Bible and then you pray and then you go about your day and then there's a need and then there's, you know, whatever it is, you, the, 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 the Bible that you've read, God can use for that need, for that day, and it just comes naturally and it just turns into a prayer. And I, I think that's been something that has just grown and grown and grown and grown over the years so that, so that we pray for pretty much anything at any time, um, but it's short, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, I love going to, to prayer meetings when there's a very specific thing that we can pray and all the rest, but mm -hmm. in a marriage, in a family, in day-to-day -day life, Rather than it being intense, it's really doable, but it just becomes a part and, of what we and, do. And, you know, hospitality is such a big part of, of marriage and a home, yeah, a Christian yeah. home, inviting people in, and this sense that Jesus is there in, in the home. We've, we've asked him to come, to fill us, to fill our home, and so on. And, and we love hosting, yeah. and we will always seek to pray before somebody comes, Lord, just be mm. here, guide the conversation, fill this place, encourage that, whatever it is, yeah. something like that. So, so it's inviting Jesus into every, every space, every part, every place of our life. Mm. You know, to finish off today, friends, it's been rich. I could talk with you for hours, but I recognize hours is an energy <laughs> expense we don't all have. But we, uh, there are people listening today who they're Christians and their marriage is on the brink. Mm. It's not doing too well. There'll be people listening today who are non-Christians in a much similar way. And you have such a heart for marriages. What, what would be a word of encouragement or a heart that you would have just to remind them in those moments as they're tuning in to finish off this podcast? 
I would say to anyone who's struggling, don't give up. Mm. Things can change. They can change dramatically and radically. And we know so many couples now who say some years ago, they felt their marriage was on the brink, mm. but they've done something, something like coming on the marriage course, something like going to talk to, mm. to somebody. And, and things have changed around, turned around. Mm. They've started to mm. open up communication again. And now they would say they're happier and stronger together than they've ever been. Mm. So we would say to couples, please don't give up. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. I appreciate mm. that. Silla, I wonder, could I ask you to finish the podcast by praying yeah. for the marriages and relationships that people I would really today? love that. Yeah, it would be beautiful. Lord, we thank you that you are the God of love and you've made known to us your ways of love. And you've said, love is patient, love is kind, love keeps no record of wrongs. Love protects. Love never fails. And I want to pray for anybody listening to this podcast that they would reach out to you to guide them and to strengthen them and help them in their relationship, whether that's a marriage relationship, a parent-child relationship, a colleague, whatever, a friend, just for your love. And I ask that you would lead and guide them. You'd show them your ways of loving. Thank you for your grace in our lives that you want to give us your truths about love, your ways of, of um, loving. And so we ask that you would do this for us, for each one of us in our own unique situations. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you both so much. Well, welcome back. Uh, it was great listening to Nikki and Silla Lee, uh, Jess. It was such a such beautiful conversation and really genuinely beautiful people yeah. as well. It was a pleasure having them with us. What was something that really grabbed you from the conversation? Um, I just can't believe they've been married for so long and like just the way they interact. Yeah. Like you can just tell they just love each other so much. I mean, not all the time, but there is just that awe about them that they're constantly in awe of each other. And I just mm. love that. Um, a misconception that I have had and I'm sure a lot of people have had is that marriage can be this restraining thing, um, this, this sort of like bond that you have with each other, but it, but it can be limiting. Um, and the way they spoke about marriage is that it's a liberating thing. It's, mm. it's freedom. It's mm. um, something beautiful to celebrate. Mm. And I just... I want more of that. I want to like spread that more into society. Um, and I love how they touched on, you know, at the moment, the way things are moving is that we are practicing marital, 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 what's the word? Marital? Marital. Marital habits outside of marriage, whether mm. that's sex, living together, having kids together. So we've sort of like- Criticising each other. Criticising each other, <laughs> disrespecting each other. Um, Those holding things grudges. don't need to be in marriage though. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about um, from experience or? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but um, so it was sort of like flip the, flip the tail where, you know, God calls us to do all those things mm. after marriage. Mm. Um, yeah, what, what were your thoughts on that? Oh, you know, I, I agree. I, I think we've also got to recognise that Christians can sometimes have a really big opinion about marriage in the world yeah. and not recognise that we haven't done a great job of portraying the biblical mm. image of marriage mm. in a way which is godly, in a way which is honouring, in a way which is attractive. Yeah. I think we often hold the world to standards that we struggle to live out ourselves. Absolutely. And so really redeeming marriage as a gift, as a blessing, yeah. it's also something to work on. Yeah. And also realising that marriage also isn't the goal. Jesus yeah. is the goal. You're finding, you're finding someone to help you in that pursuit of becoming I like Jesus. That. It's not necessarily the win. I mean, anyone that's been mm. married will know you, you get married and a lot of the pre-held conceptions get dashed pretty fast. Yeah, wow. Marriage is a vessel that God uses to shape you. Yeah. Not just delight you, but it does delight you. And I have a great marriage with my How wife, How long Sarah. have you been married to Sarah for? 12 years now. 12 wow. Years. Well, 12 years is coming December. December 2024 will be 12 years married. Wow. 
And what are the things that you guys do in your marriage to sort of keep that love and keep that like gaze on Jesus as you guys grow together? Wow. Okay. (laughs) No, you know what it is? I think I respect couples a lot that have this systemic approach to how they do things. And Mm. I really agree with that. We've got a four-year-old, a two-year-old and a six-month-old. Crazy. And a dog who isn't got the best of health. Mm. And so like our world's pretty wild. Yeah. But I think one thing that I'd say has been central to our marriage, particularly around our faith, is communication. Mm. We talk about how we are going with God and how we're going with each other. How's our prayer life together going? How's it going with our kids? How's it going with, how's how's our disciples? our walk, yeah. being employed by the church, we've got to really differentiate between my witness as a pastor yes. and the intimate relationship we share together and the intimate relationship we both share with God. Yeah. So really making sure that there are conversations and things that only Sarah and I really talk about together. Mm. Um, not, not intimacy physically, but intimacy emotionally and spiritually yeah. has been really important for us. And yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah. and I think, you know, we've done alpha marriage. My encouragement would be if you've never done alpha marriage and you're mm. married or you think about getting married, um, the alpha courses are phenomenal preparation. So good. Um, plug into those, step in there. In fact, if you have not done Alpha and you are uh, asking questions about Jesus, maybe the first step for you is to jump onto alpha.org.au, find an Alpha course running near you um, that you might learn what it means to become more like Jesus. So friends, thank you so much for joining us for the podcast today. Jess, if people want to get involved or engage with the podcast, how might they do that? Uh, Make sure to subscribe and like our videos on YouTube. We're on Spotify and iTunes as well, friends. Or otherwise, click on to church.nu slash become a slash podcast and that's where you see all our updates. Yeah, fantastic. Well, friends, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you again next time for another great conversation about what it means to become more like Jesus. See you then. Thanks for listening. We hope we passed on some valuable knowledge on how you can become and lead a life more like Jesus. If this message inspired you, please make sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a single podcast or share it with a friend. And for more information and resources on what we discussed today, please visit church.nu slash becoming. See you next time and God bless.